Okay, so what we're starting is uh, starting with today is a, a two-part sort of series of lectures, which are sort of gonna put together everything that we've done since uh, the start of the unit, taking on board everything that we've learned, and we're gonna put it together uh, in the formulation of a game. Um, that game is called Wilf the Swin Window Smasher, and along with a couple of extra things that we're gonna learn in this lesson, we're going to uh, build. Uh, a small game utilizing everything that we've done before and in this lecture I'm going to give you a very quick demo of the game uh, a copy of it will be on the VLE so you can have a go yourself and there'll be some other demonstrations of the other elements that you need to learn in order to build this game as well so the game itself has a central character who's Wilf the window smasher and that's played by the computer and the player i.e you play the role of the caretaker and the way that the game works is that wilf will move around the board and it's his job to basically smash windows uh, in a building and you have to try and catch him before he reaches a maximum number of points in order to win the playing grid itself is a straight uh, two-dimensional uh, 10 by 10 grid and uh, any player's position is indicated by the XY coordinate. X runs from 1 to 10 across the top and Y runs from 1 to 10 down the side. As you can see X goes up from left to right, Y goes up from top to bottom. Um, the interesting point is, is that the W's in the grid represent the positions of the windows. Now, they've been placed specifically in positions where the X and Y coordinates are always even numbers. Now, we're gonna, that's quite important when we're working out the location of a window as part of the game. But, for example, 8, 2, uh, 4, 4, uh, 2, 6, 10 to they're all x y coordinates where the two values are even so it's actually important that you sort of uh, bear that in mind when we carry on so the window smasher starts uh, at a random position on the grid anywhere from 1 to 10 x y there's also a random initial direction now that's done by generating uh, a random number which can either be minus 1 0 or plus 1 and those values will be used to generate the direction that they move. So as an example, if the two initial values are uh, minus one, minus one, it basically means they're moving in a minus one direction from X, which means they're moving left, and a minus one direction in Y, which means they're moving up. So they're moving diagonally up and left. On the opposite hand, if they're moving positive x, positive y, or 1, 1. Positive x means they're moving right. Positive y means they're moving down. And one more example, for example, this one. Positive x, 1, means they're moving right. And 0 means they're neither moving positive or negative x, y even. So they're actually staying completely straight. So the window smasher moves around the grid and as he moves around he's actually got a 1 in 4 chance, a 25% chance of actually changing in another random direction. So they're not, he's not moving in straight lines all the time, there might be that he actually changes direction randomly. Um, and he moves one space in his current direction, wherever he moves. If he reaches the edges of the plane, plane square he actually bounces. Now what that means is that he will stick to either the top, the bottom, the left or the right, but his current direction will just be reversed. So let's take an example for that, is that if he's moving from left to right and he hits the right hand side and he's going straight, all he will do is he will move directly from left to right and go from right to left. So it's like he bounces, like a ball that bounces on the surface. Okay, 
Another little indicator to help us is that when he reaches a boundary, top, bottom, left or right, we get an indication of where he's bounced. Not exactly in terms of X and Y location, but it'll give us an indication as to where, in general, the caretaker might need to look. So the rules of the game are generally straightforward. The window smasher always starts, so he'll move, move again, and after that second move, he'll check to see if there's a window. You know where the position of the windows are. Uh, they're always at locations where X and Y are even. If he lands on a square with a window on it, it gets smashed. The window smasher gets five points. He then goes back to step two, where he'll move again. And there's a possibility that he could smash another window in a new location and go in a bit of a cycle there. Failing that, when a window gets smashed, it reveals where the window is smashed to the caretaker, again as a bit of a clue as to where he is. If he doesn't smash a window, he just has one more move and his turn ends. This is where you come in, because what you've got to do now is guess the XY position of the window smasher by typing in an XY location. If you catch catch him close enough or you guess close enough you manage to catch him and you win straight away if you don't catch him by guessing close enough he might sneak past you in which case the window smasher will actually get another 10 points for being really really close now the position of your guess and whether the window smasher sneaks past is based on these rules so let's say that um, you make a guess. Let's say the, the window smashes at this location and you make a guess that lands within the red zone in this bit. So anywhere around or obviously at the same location. That means that you've caught the window smasher. If you make a guess and it lands in any of the blue parts, it means that you're within two and a half units away from work. The window smasher is and that's where you get a sneak away and the window smasher gets 10 points for sneaking off anything outside of that has no effect you haven't got anywhere near them so you keep going through that cycle you take alternate turns and either you catch the window smasher and you win or the window smasher reaches a target number of points could be 40 50 might be able to set it yourself in which case the window smasher wins what we're going to do is just get a little bit of experience of having a go at the game and by all means you can download it and have a go at it and even examine the code just to give you an idea of uh, how the game actually works and that's what we're going to do now okay so I've downloaded the window smasher program from the VLE um, I've extracted it and I've opened it up in BlueJay. Um, first thing you probably noticed is that there's another little class that's been included called Smasher Sounds. You're probably going to hear this being used as part of the game's played. It's just a little class that's included that has got some sound effects. Um, depending on how well I have a go at this game, depends on whether you hear them or not. But Windows Smasher also uses the user class as well, uh, mainly because you'll need things like user.inputint in order to type numbers in. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll have a quick go. Um, if it doesn't go very well, I might have another go. If it does go well, then we'll, we'll move on. So I'm going to create an instance of a window smasher. And to start me off, I have to type in a score for the window smasher to win. I'm going to set it quite low because otherwise you're just going to sit and watch me playing a game. So I'm just going to set it to 20. And as part of that, I'm now just going to run the game by calling play around and what happens is is that we get output from the game by getting message boxes so at the minute the smasher is bouncing at the left so that's one of his first two initial moves so he's obviously on the left hand side in the uh, sort of x one two area 
and he's had his go and nothing's happened he hasn't got any windows so let's make a guess at one and y value of four somewhere near the middle <laughs> now at that point he was within two and a half units of our position he sneaked past me and he's now got 10 points so we still we were quite quite close with one four about halfway down on the left hand side so after that we have to play another round and as you can tell from that he's actually broken a window at 4-2 that means he's got another five points so his score is at 15 so 4-2 that's where he is he's probably moved around 4-2 we don't know what direction so let's try straight down and let's say um, four uh, for X and three for Y <laughs> and straight away we know by that sound he's snuck by me again so he's actually got 25 points and if we play another <laughs> He's actually smashed another window and got more points for that. So, again, we'll have one more go at trying to catch him. He was at 8 2, so I'm going to guess 9 3. So, 9 for X and Y. At three. And, surprisingly, luckily as well, I've actually caught him at 10 2. Okay, so that's a basic demo of the game. Like I say, I think you should be downloading this and having a go yourself just to give you an idea of how this game actually works. Okay, so we've had a look at the, the big program uh, for Windows Smasher. We're going to have to have a look at some uh, new elements that are included as part of this. Um, three, th three areas that we need to cover. One is dealing with fractional data so that everything we've done so far has been integers so we've got to deal with fractional data and things with uh, sort of values after the decimal point we're going to have to deal with random numbers and we're going to have to deal with methods that actually send data back uh, after we've called them so the rest of the lecture is basically devoted to looking at each of these um, in turn so let's get those covered as quickly as we can first of all as i said before all everything that we've done so far has been dealing with whole numbers so we're very used now to dealing with integer declarations um but we have two ways that we can uh, deal with um, variables with numbers with fractional parts um We've got floats uh, and the float data type for dealing with what we call floating point numbers. Or we can use a much more accurate representation called a double. Uh, the technical term is a double precision number. Um, for the sake of the unit, we will be dealing with floats. Okay, so if that makes life a little bit easier for you, anything with a fractional, uh, fractional part to it, uh, we just declare it as a float. So let's have a look at one of those working. Okay, so I've downloaded the program called Double Calc off uh, the VLE. Uh, opened it up in BlueJ, just give it a quick compile. And let's open it in the editor and have a look. Okay, so what's new? Well, the structure is pretty much the same. The layout, the class, the constants, the instance variables, the constructor and the methods are all the same. What we've got that's slightly different is we've declared an instance variable with a double as a double called m number. And you can see in the constructor, I've initialized it with a value of 0, 0.0. Now with ints, we would just set it to zero. So we've got two methods one called uh, add number now uh, add number has um, a parameter 
uh, called p new num and when we call add number the program's going to stop and it's going to ask us to type in a double and we're going to keep uh, a running total in this program whereby it's going to get that value that I type in and it's going to add it to the running total which is stored in m number which demo that for you in a minute and what we're going to do at some point is when we've finished adding numbers we'll be able to call display and reset and that's going to use a user dot message box and it's going to output the value of m number uh, and by doing that it's just going to tell us what the sum of all the numbers is and then reset m number back to zero again so we can basically use it uh, another time so i'll do some simple uh fractional numbers so that you can sort of keep up i'll keep the inspector open so we can see what's going on and as you can see there it's 0, 0.0 now watch when i call add number it's going to prompt me for a double without me using user dot input int which is what you've probably seen me use in previous lectures so this was done without the user class because it had a parameter it's actually prompting me to type it in so i'll do something simple like 1.1 okay so it's added 1.1 if i call it again again what will happen is that it will prompt me to type it in so i'll put in 2.2 because obviously 1.1 and 2.2 added together make 3.3 you can see there that it's actually just got loads of zero representations but intrinsically it's still 3.3 so what i'm going to do now is call display and reset this one uses the user class as you can see there we've got a 3.3 with a tiny tiny little fragment at the end we'll not worry about that for this example but when i click ok it resets the double back to zero all right so what we've got to think about now is we're now in a position where we've got integer data types and we've got uh data types like doubles and floats and if we start mixing them up and we're not careful what we could do is probably set ourselves up for a bit of trouble because uh, the java language sometimes will perform certain sort of operations on mixed data types ints with floats or ints with doubles or doubles with floats and we need to make sure that we're in the right way to actually uh, deal with them so if for example you have an integer and you put an integer into a fractional data type like a float or a double that's perfectly fine uh, it's like saying one turned into a float becomes 1.0 that's perfectly fine if you have a fractional number like 1.1 1 .1, uh, or maybe even a, a much a, you know much uh, more accurate one like 0 0.0005 and you attempt to put that sort of a value into an integer what it will do is it will actually lose the fractional bit it actually cuts it off where the decimal point is so what it does is it actually truncates if you have a float and you turn it into a double or assign it to a double that's fine but again if you have a double that might be a very big number or a very small number and you assign it to a float then you have a loss of accuracy in that as well i don't think for the sake of the module it's it's going to be a particularly um pressing issue for completing assignments but you do need to make yourself aware that sometimes when you're dealing with these combining of data types you can set yourself up for a bit of trouble if you're not careful so we have to be very careful okay let's say you've got two integers and uh, let's say you're dividing them um now there are situations where you have two integers and you divide them that you do get a number with a fractional part so if you do three divided by two it's 1.5 so 
the result of the division won't be an integer. It will be a float or a double. So what you have to do is make sure that you've got the right way to deal with the results of calculations. Otherwise, you're going to find that you're going to lose the accuracy of the data that you've got. And the way that that can be done is through something called casting. And it's generally pretty straightforward to do. Let's give you a couple of examples with this one. We've got two integer variables. And uh, let's say for, for, for the sake of an example, num1 has got the value of 3 in it. And num2 has got the value of 2 in it. Now, straight away, we all know that 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. So, if result 1 is a float variable, the result of it dividing two integers has to be turned into a float in order for it to be able to go into this variable properly. So by using casting, we're taking this result of 3 divided by 2, which is the division of two integers, and we're turning it into a float and putting it in that variable. In a similar situation, let's say again we've got num1 is equal to 3 and num2 is equal to 2, but result 2 this time is a double and not a float. 3 divided by 2 is still 1.5 but we have to cast the result to a double before we put it into the relevant variable data type. And it's important that we understand the concept of casting, particularly when you're doing certain types of calculations. It is quite important. The next thing that we're going to look at is the concept of generating random numbers. Uh, the Windows Smasher game uses random numbers in lots of places. And uh, what we're going to do is just look at uh, an example program which allows us to write our own programs to generate random numbers. And we're going to use uh, a, a class that already exists in Java for doing this job for us. And what we do is we use it a little bit like we use the user class and what we're going to do is we're going to make a call to uh, uh, something called a library or a package and we're allowed to import that package to allow us to give us that functionality to uh, generate our own random numbers so just some new things that we have to generate first of all right at the top of the program we have to type this in. Now what this allows us to do is call the random number generator uh, function and import it into our program. So that's the first thing you have to do. We then have to get uh, an object or we have to get a copy of the random number generator code uh, and to be able we need to be able to um, create a copy of that particular code so that we can use it in our own programs and it's actually done in two parts this bit which is the random mrand gen this generates a copy of the code and then we tell generally in the constructor that we want uh, a new copy of that random number generator to be created so together it brings together the functionality of random number generation into our program. Uh, you don't need to change these in any way. So when you have uh, uh, some programs that you're going to write which generate random numbers, all you need to do is just basically copy that code and put it in the right place and uh, it'll just work. In your programs, you need to be able to generate your random integers. Now, in this particular example, we want to generate a number in the range from 0 to, we've said here, max minus 1. So, for example, we want to generate a number between 0 and uh, 100. 
So what we'll do is we'll set the value of max here to 100, uh, 101 because max has to be max minus 1. Again, we'll look at an example to show you that. We can also uh, generate two different types of random numbers. This example generates integers. So we have a random integer, which is an integer variable, and it'll be random.nextint max, which will be uh, an integer between 0 and max minus 1. There's also another part of it called next float. And that allows us to generate decimal numbers. And by default, all random decimals will be generated in the range of 0 to 1. So for example, 0 0.4, 0 0.35, 0 0.84, they're all random decimals between 0 and 1. And we will be using that in later um, demonstrations. So let's have a look at the first one, which is called adding test. Okay, so I've... Uh, Open the program, downloaded the program from VLE called Add in Test. Done a quick compile, so let's have a look at it in the editor. And it just puts into context some of the things that we've talked about with relation to random numbers. First thing, whenever you're dealing with random numbers, you always put that line at the top. Import java.util.random. If you don't put that in, you won't be able to generate random numbers. Okay, so that's the first thing. And notice it goes above the class definition. It goes above the header at the top to tell you who wrote it and when and what the program does. It goes right at the very top. And you will be looking at other import statements um, later on. And they will go in the same place one after another. But you'll see that later on. Let's look at the um, program and what it does. We've got a constant called rand max which is 11 we're using that in a second we've got three instance variables now notice that's the first one which generates or creates a link to a random number generator again that's straight out of the lecture notes you can put that in as it stands we've got two integers one called m score and one called m count and then in the constructor, we set m score and m count to zero. So we're just initializing them. And then here's the other example, again, straight out of the lecture notes, of creating the instance of the random generator and then making a copy of that random generator so that we can use it in the rest of our program. Okay. Then we get into the methods. Okay. And what we've got is one method called test add it's got four local variables num1 num2 sum and guess so the first line is that it will generate a random integer from zero to rand max now remember that will generate in zero to that value minus one so rand max was set at the top to 11 so the range of random numbers for num1 will be from 0 to 11 minus 1, which is 10. That will also happen in this one for num2. Num2, again, is a random integer generated from 0 to rand max minus 1. So again, that's 11 minus 1, which is 10. We get the two random numbers and we add them together and we store the answer in sum so that basically sets up a random pair of numbers between 0 and 10 adds them together and stores the answer away we then have a variable called guess and that uses user.inputInt and we say enter the value of num1 added to so it's a plus sign num2 so it's basically displaying a question and allow us to enter input the answer and that'll be stored in guess and then we add one onto count so we're obviously counting up how many times we have a go 
We've then got an if statement. If the guess, which is what I've typed in, is equal to the sum, which is the answer, the real answer to the sum, we'll add one on to score and tell us we're right. Otherwise, it'll tell us that we're not right and it'll give us the right answer. So what's happening is, is that we're going to count how many questions we're going to be asked. If we get the answer right, we add one on to correct and tell us. If it's not correct and the two are different, it'll just tell us the answer. So that's the test add method. You've then got a tiny little method at the bottom called display score, which will display that I've got so many questions right from M score out of M count number of attempts. Okay, let's give it a quick compile and let's have a go. So we'll create an instance and let's call test add. So straight away it says, what's well, seven plus two? Well, let's get that one right, so that's nine, which tells me that I'm correct. Let's do another one. Two plus 10, well, I don't know about this one, so I'll put 11 and again, tells me I'm incorrect but it gives me the right answer so I've got one right and one wrong and let's have another go and it's asking me for one plus five I get that one right that's easy that's six and it tells me that I'm correct so I've got two right one wrong let's check that by Shane showing display score and the user dot message tells me that I've got two out of three Okay, the final little bit uh, for this particular lecture is all about returning values. Now, if you go way back and look at what we did in unit five, we looked about passing data into methods using parameters. So we had the brackets with a variable in the brackets so we could pass parameters in. But we can have methods which will actually send data back from the method. Right, these are called return values and uh, they're just as available in languages like VB and Python and it basically means that we can call a method, make it do some work and then get a result back. And we use a, a statement called return and that allows us to return data back from it. So this is the, how it works and here's an example. So we've got a method and it's called obtain marks and in this example we've just got an integer that comes in of called p test number now everything that we've done so far this particular bit used the word void and we've replaced the word void with the word with with int now what that means for us is that once this method has been completed we are going to return a value and the value is the integer called marks and because marks is an integer we have to tell it here the data type of the value that comes back from obtain marks so if you imagine how that works I pass a value in, let's say, well, I don't know, 20 here. I call this method and 20 comes into this variable. I then have a local variable called marks. And let's say underneath here, uh, let's say written very badly, let marks equals P test number this is so badly written p test number plus five so i've added five onto p test number so what we're looking at is 20 plus five is 25 so the value of 25 goes into marks 
I then return marks. So the value of marks gets returned and it's, a, it's an integer data type. So what we're doing is we're sending a value to the method, we're doing some work on it, we're returning the value and we're sending it back to where it was called from. Okay. So we'll have a look at that. Uh, we'll look at a programmed example and we'll just see how we get on with that. Okay, so I've got hold of the project called Grade Calc, uh, which is on VLE with everything else. So let's have a quick look at the code. And let's just break it down and see what happens. First of all, uh, the whole program is about a basic adding test for children. We've got two constants. We've got percentage minimum, which is zero, and percentage maximum, which is 100. Okay, so there are two constants. We've also got a double, so it's got fractional parts, called MTCT. Okay, TCT uh, means time constraint test, or an exam, or something like that. And we set the value of TCT to zero in the constructor. And in terms of the methods, what we're doing is we've got one called process TCT. Nothing different in here. This just looks like an ordinary processor of information. So we call process TCT. And then what we do is we have two variables, one called test one, one called test two. But the interesting thing is what happens here, because we're going to send some data to a method. We've got a method called obtain marks, which must live somewhere down here. We're going to send the value of one to obtain marks. And whatever comes back will go into that method, uh, that variable there. So let's have a look at obtain marks one. So Go to obtain marks, which is here. And remember that the value of one is the P test number at this point is one. So we have a local variable called marks and it says, let the value in marks be user.inputInt, enter marks for test P test number. Now remember we passed one. So it should say enter marks for test one. We type it in and it gets stored in marks. Now remember, before we've used a while loop before to check that a value that we type in is uh, valid. In this case, we've done the same again. If the value of marks is less than percentage minimum, which is zero, or marks is greater than percentage maximum, we make them type it in again. So we get the value from the input box either there and it's right first time or we keep them at it until they get it right and then we return marks because in the in the method call the data type of the return value is an int so we return marks which is an integer and it goes back to here because we've sent the value typed it in correctly and it comes back in here We do the same again in this example where we call obtain marks this time sending the value of two so again to p test number is two it will say enter the marks for test two store that in there in marks if it's less than 100 or less than zero or greater than 100 force them to get it right and then it will return the value that we type in, only this time it stores it in test two. So we've got the two bits of data from our obtain marks method. We then assume that your test one and test two grades have a 50-50 weighting, which means they're worth 50% each. So we add the two marks together 
divide it by 2 because they're both about, uh, percentages out of 100 we then cast to a double because we're dividing by 2 so 2 integers halved can give us a fractional result so we have to cast it to a fractional integer uh, a fractional double or a fractional number and store it in mtct mtct being a double that we declared up there that's quite a long complex example so you could do with following this through yourself when we call display result all it does is a user dot message to tell us that our tct mark is whatever the value of the calculation all right so as a quick example let's assume that we got 50%, 50 percent 50 out of 100 in test one and 50 out of 100 in test two that gives us 100 out of 200 so if you divide that by two that means we should get 50 percent overall so unless my math is really bad let's have a look to see if we're right okay so we'll just create an instance and run process tct which will give us both tests so we'll input the grade marks for test one where we scored 50 out of 100 and we'll type in the marks for test two where we got 50 out of 100 and then we'll call display result and tells us that our total TCT mark across both tests is 50% okay so we've done some introductory work leading us into our Windows Smasher case study and we've basically looked at three areas which we're going to need to understand in a bit more detail before we can examine things uh, and examine the game in more detail uh, that included the use of fractional data in the form of floats or doubles which gave rise to looking at how we cast um, fractional data we've also looked at the use of the random package using import statements and using those to add more functionality for generating random numbers and we've had a very quick look at how we can now make methods do a bit more work for us uh, as we show that we can get data passed back from methods using a keyword called return.